we are here in Oslo with Professor Rogizzi, who was just given a talk at the workshop on the water over the left periphery, also by the University of Oslo, and uh, he's been so kind as to agree to give an interview to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the publication of the fine structure of the left periphery. So we have a couple of questions for you. So the first question is, during the workshop you've stated several times that you're not in favor of calling your approach thin plastic. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, yes, the idea of a template is essentially the idea that the explanation stops when you identify the sequence of positions that form a certain zone of the syntactic tree. And this was never intended really within uh, the cartographic tradition. So uh, there is in cartography uh, an important uh, descriptive side. So we want to draw maps as precise as possible of structures for different languages and for different zones of the tree, uh, but, uh, but that is only part of the enterprise. And the next part is that uh, the discoveries, the empirical properties that are observed through that work uh, call for an explanation. So they function as extra things that we want to understand by connecting them to deeper principles of the universal drama. Clearly, it wouldn't make much sense uh, to stipulate or to make the assumption that uh, these complex properties that we identify are encoded uh, uh, in universal grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, that would uh, raise major evolutionary problems. I mean, why should UG evolve with uh, such properties and characteristics? Um, so that uh, the uh, tension between issues of learnability and the issues of mobility uh, can be resolved if uh, these properties uh, can be somehow traced back uh, to reasonable mm -hmm. UG principles, yeah. or simpler principles having to do either with the syntactic computations or the interpretation of the interface. Okay, the second question is, if the syntactic derivation signals this course function such as topic and focus, um, what role might be left for compositional semantics or pragmatics? Yeah, well, of course, a big role because uh, interpretation takes place there. But uh, uh, as you know, uh, th there is this concept that uh, Guillermo Cinque and I uh, care uh, a lot about, which is the so-called syntacticization mm -hmm. of, of uh, semantics and pragmatics, which doesn't mean that the syntax can do the whole job. Obviously, that's not possible. We still need an interpretation, right? Uh, but uh, the idea is that syntax uh, uh, offers very transparent uh, schemata which can be used by the interpretive systems for interpretation, in fact, on both, um, um, on both levels of uh, PF and LF, on both interface levels. And so clearly the, then uh, at that point the real interpretation starts, mm -hmm. but still syntax is very friendly to the interfaces in that uh, particular conception. Mm -hmm. Third question. So uh, we saw many of the contributions at the workshop question the idea, for example, that there is a dedicated projection focus, and they suggested that the position of focus is uh, somehow derived from prosodic restrictions, for example. What do you feel is the main uh, drawbacks, the main drawback of uh, those kinds of uh, approaches to the left periphery? Yeah, well, uh, it seems to me that uh, there are interesting empirical questions that uh, have been discussed, I think, really in uh, depth, in a very interesting manner at the workshop. So what is clear uh, is that some languages provide direct evidence for uh, the presence of a system of heads in the left periphery, uh, heads that signal topic, focus, and so on and so forth. And then empirical questions start. One is uh, what was discussed yesterday, for instance, in Klaus Abel's uh, presentation. Uh, is it the case that these heads uh, are part of the closed spine and take uh, the nominal expression that is interpreted as topic, focus, and so on as specifier, or they are case like elements attached, directly attached to uh, the nominal expression. That's an important empirical issue which I try to uh, address in work and uh, uh, I think that the jury is still out and it, it's entirely possible that both approaches uh, are right. That is to say, in some cases, uh, these properties are signaled uh, by heads that belong to the closed spine and in other cases are uh, signaled by uh, case-like uh, 
endings on uh, nominal expressions. And then there's the question of what happens in languages uh, in which you don't uh, see directly these heads, mm -hmm. and you use other devices uh, like uh, intonation, for instance, very short contours. And uh, uh, my viewpoint has always been that uh, as uh, at least some languages offer clear evidence for system of heads, mm -hmm. uh, then under uniformity assumptions, uh, try to push the idea that all languages use such a struct structural configuration so for uh, expressing the properties in questions. But this raises the very important question of the in situ status uh, of focus, for instance, and of other interface properties. And that is a very important issue that has been discussed in part and uh, that I would like to come back to in the future. Mm -hmm. So cross-linguistically, uh, we observe that there is considerable variation at the level of the core clause. So we have SOV and we have SVO. And a lot of scholars have suggested that it's possible to account for that simply by rejecting the LCA or anyway the idea that base generation is universal. Do you think an explanation along those lines would be entirely excluded from the left periphery? Um, well, the, the, the relation that uh, cartographic uh, work has with the LCA is a relation of compatibility, essentially. Well, and maybe a little more than that, uh, uh, because what uh, comes out from the LCA uh, is uh, um, the fact that uh, structural representations have certain properties that are very congenial, in fact, to the cartographic trick approach. For instance, uh, the fact that there are no multiple specifiers uh, that there's no distinction between being a specifier and being an adjunct. So these ideas, which uh, derive from Kane's approach, uh, are in fact very important for, um, have been very important in cartographic uh, analysis. So, um, on the other hand, what is clear is that uh, in uh, the study of the left periphery, in cartographic work in general, there are principles and parameters. And, mm -hmm. Uh, everywhere in uh, syntactic theory. That is to say, if you uh, study in detail structural properties across languages, you observe that some properties are common, so there is a common core of implicit universals, in spite of recent discussions that seem to doubt uh, that idea. I strongly believe that there's a strong core of implicit universals. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there is variation, and we cannot uh, simply ignore that and a part of our uh, work as uh, linguists, as comparative linguists, is to identify the exact elements of variation and express them. So that, um, you know, that there should be structural parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, I have proposed a number in the case of the left periphery, and I have no doubt that uh, variation uh, must, can, can be expressed and must be expressed uh, to that, uh, that kind of assumption. The general question whether the LCA holds in its full glory or it should be weakened, uh, well, that the, the cartographic work does not bear very directly on that mm -hmm. issue that is very important. Of course. Um, so, of course, we are talking about the left periphery of the clause, but uh, there have been some suggestions that uh, there are peripheries in other parts of the sentence, so for example, the edge of the verbal phrase. So to the extent that these peripheries may be similar to the ones we have in the left periphery, uh, what, does, what does that tell us about the way peripheries are ordered? And yeah. What does that tell about the left periphery? Right. Uh, uh, yes, this, is, this relates to work done by Adriano Belletti and others uh, on the existence of a focus position and a topic position, or several topic positions perhaps, uh, uh, which are associated not only to full clauses, uh, but uh, we could say to uh, what have been considered phases. And so not just the CP phase, but uh, also the uh, small VP phase. And of course, a very interesting question if that approach is on the right track is uh, what are the systematic differences, if any, between the two peripheries. And perhaps there are some systematic differences. So, but, uh, uh, for instance, yesterday we heard in uh, Caterina Bonan's talk a very interesting utilization of the low periphery for constructions that typically involve the high periphery. That is to say, the language uh, uh, she was looking at, the Trevigiano dialect, seems to exploit very directly the low periphery also 
for WH construction. So, and so there is an interesting interplay between the two peripheries in that case because of the interrogative character of a structure is signaled both by the high periphery with inversion and by the low periphery with movement of the WH elements to a position adjacent to the verb. So that is an example of an interesting mm -hmm. interplay between the two peripheries. Mm -hmm. So we've been uh, working on left periphery for 20 years since your paper, well, more than that actually, but uh, what do you think that the cartographic research on the left periphery has shown us during this 20 years? So well, is there something you're really proud of? <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope uh, a lot of progress has been made sure. uh, on these properties. I think that uh, uh, many detailed structural properties that uh, and not been observed before uh, have come out in this uh, 20 years. Uh, for instance, the fact that uh, if we analyze things uh, uh, finely enough, we observe that even assuming a single position for WHN, a single target for WH movement, is not correct yes. because we have to uh, identify distinct positions. Uh, for instance, for bare WH elements, for lexical restricted WH elements, mm -hmm. perhaps discourse linked WH elements also have different targets with respect to the other elements, not to speak of other major way. distinctions, yeah, exactly, like main, uh, main movement in main and embedded domains. And the same is probably true for other properties of the left periphery, like topic, for instance. I cannot say that there is a single topic position, there are distinct positions with different interpretive properties uh, which correspond to position differences as emerges from work by Prascarelli, Bianchi, Hinterholz and uh, other people. So uh, it, it seems to me quite clear that uh, we now have a much more detailed picture of what happens in these constructions that have a big impact on the interpretive interfaces. Um. So is there anything in your personal outlook of the left, on the left periphery that has changed dramatically in the past 20 years? Is there anything, any position you might have taken that you now feel is way too strong? Uh, well, let's say that uh, initially perhaps uh, I had, uh, uh, I, I was working under the assumption of a complete uniformity across languages, and that uh, clearly seems to be too strong. And uh, very clearly, that is yeah. the initial stage, right? So you have to start from there, and then right, exactly, right, right, okay, precisely. That, that that's something that I try to stress also in my yeah. talk. Uh, it, it's very important to do comparative work to start from an initial assumption of uniformity because. If you start from the assumption of uniformity and then weaken it, because clearly languages are not completely uniform, so you have to weaken it, mm -hmm. you can do comparative syntax. If you start from the opposite point, that languages are different, and then each language is described through its own categories and properties, you will never find anything, <laughs> because uh, simply we have too much imagination as uh, theoreticians. Uh, we, we can invent too many systems that are simply compatible with one another, so that if we don't start from an assumption of uniformity, comparative syntax is simply not, uh, not a doable enterprise. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We started from that assumption. And then I think we made a lot of pro progress in identifying the points in which genuine variation is fine. So one thing you've been stressing out lately is the idea of uh, labeling algorithms to derive principles such as the criterial phrasing. So could you maybe summarize that a bit? So explain the idea a bit for those who are really not up to date for that kind yeah. of the work. Well, uh, if you adopt uh, X-bar theory, uh, there is no labeling problem. Basically, you have the label that is determined by the X-bar schemata. Um, if you assume that the fundamental uh, uh, structure building operation is merged, then there is a labeling problem uh, because you, you must assign a name to the category that, uh, that, that you are producing. So you need a labeling algorithm. And then the idea in recent work that Chomsky has done, that they have done, is to somehow use that uh, as a tool 
uh, to derive certain properties, certain other properties. And uh, the idea that uh, I tried to discuss in uh, the talk at uh, the workshop is that maybe this tool can be used to account for something that at first sight is very different and very uh, far away from the issue of just giving names to structures, is to say the fact that there are freezing effects, that uh, in some cases when you move an element to a certain position, then you cannot move it further, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that particularly what I call criteria positions so have quite systematically this uh, kind of property, and uh, the reduction is possible by making simple assumptions about flavoring and by assuming a maximality principle, which I think has a certain uh, uh, plausibility in general, as you say, the fact that when you perform an operation to a certain element, you must take the maximal element of that kind uh, to undergo the operation. So, and I think this is going to be the last question. Um, is there any aspect or research direction that you may not have the time to focus on, but you think the next 20 years of research on the left breaker should focus on because it's particularly promising or any? It's always very dangerous to make uh, predictions about the future, yeah. uh, particularly in research, because uh, then uh, when, when you least expect it, some new direction comes up and uh, then everything that you had expected simply is, is not, does not, does not materialize, but... Uh, uh, but if you were to make... Uh, right, if I, were, if I were to make... Or one suggestion, anyway, where right. is there? Well, it seems to me that one very important topic that uh, I would like to address and I would like uh, to uh, see addressed in detailed work is again something that uh, came up at the, the workshop, that is to say, how do we account for certain elements of variation uh, in the use of the left periphery, uh, for instance, in V2 languages, and verb second languages, because at, at first sight, such languages uh, raise a major issue, right? You see very little of the left periphery, uh, and is that simply a consequence uh, of an independent constraint uh, that really depends on how V2 is formulated, or it, it's a real fact that the variation can be so important that in some languages only a minimal use of the left periphery can be made. Right? And uh, so it seems to me that there are a number of um, uh, interesting options that have been uh, discussed and explored at the workshop. And I believe and I hope that there are theses uh, now uh, that are being written on the topic. So I very much hope that uh, in 20 years, and perhaps we don't have to wait 20 years, but even earlier than that, uh, we will have, uh, uh, we'll make new discoveries on this very important topic. So I think we'll run it off. So thanks again for inter being interviewed and uh, yeah, we hope you enjoyed your seeing us. Thank you very much.